Jesus is King. Welcome to the 1 Peter 5 podcast, Rebuilding Christendom, Restoring Catholic Culture and Tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, editor of 1 Peter 5, and I'm joined today by Michaela and Jeremiah Harrison. How are y'all doing? We're doing doing good. well. How are you doing, Tim? <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. We're, we're very happy to talk with the Harrisons. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, product that has just been published um, with Sophia Press, and that is the Liturgy of the Home calendar. And we're talking all about that today. This is very exciting to me because uh, for me personally, because my kids love this calendar. I love this calendar. It's uh, a daily joy uh, at the Flanders household. So um, we, we talk, we've, I've, I've written at 1 Peter 5 that rebuilding Christendom is all about the children. And this is really critical. And, and, and it's really a joy that we can all do as Catholics. And we're going to talk all about that today. Um, I want to point viewers to uh, a related series we have at 1 Peter 5, and that is Forgotten Customs. This is being written by Matthew Pleasy, and he's writing a series of articles for all the big feasts about all the forgotten customs. And that's a critical thing that we need to do for children is restore and sometimes create new customs that are related to all these feasts. And uh, so there's a link below in the show notes to that series. There'll be Martin Mass coming next week. There'll be an article mm -hmm. on all the forgotten customs for Martin Mass. And uh, today we're going to talk all about the calendar. And there's a, a ton of great customs in contained in the calendar images, as well as the Harrisons are going to share some other customs as well for the month of November. Uh, so uh, let's talk about this this wonderful calendar. Uh, let me start by asking, uh, how did you guys get into this originally? Uh, tell us some of this, the background and the story of, of creating this. Well, quick, uh, I'll say one thing, which uh, we're both Benedictine Oblates of the traditional Benedictine monastery we live next to. And as of, you know, the monks are a, they're, they're a model. They're a model of how to live the liturgy in every aspect of your lives. And since we, since we sort of live in the shadow of the Abbey, uh, the desire in us has grown. It's like, how can we do this too? I want to, the monks get to have all the fun, if you will. <laughs> and uh, how can we do this too? And then of course you look around in our world today, how confusing, and there's just so much difficulty going on. How do we anchor ourselves as families with children. So this is really my, my wife. I'm speaking of it, but this, we've both felt it. And then she's the artist and she likes to create and make things. Well, so, like Tim said, it, it really does come down to the children. Can we share this with them in a way that they can embrace and participate in? And um, I think sometimes in the traditional liturgies, they, the kids get a sense of the sacred, but um, sometimes with, uh, sometimes they, they don't, they don't understand as much as we would like them to. And so, um, we, like, like my husband, Jeremiah was saying, we're very inspired by the monks, um, and the peace and the stability that they have and, um, trying to find a peace and a flow and order in our home, um, has been our goal together. And these calendars have really helped to facilitate that in we're, a way that that we're is looking very, for things that's very approachable to the children. Um, it really started um, back with Lent. So Lent calendars are pretty popular. There's quite a few of them out there, and um, I used some different resources I had found. Um, and the children really they loved it. They love the Lent calendars, especially because they're offering up sacrifices, and they want to know how much longer it's going to last, <laughs> and they can see how much longer. Um, but then after Lent's done, what about the whole Easter season? I couldn't find a calendar out there for the Easter season. Um, there was one thing, it was a sticker book that Tommy DePaolo had, um, had created, but it was out of stock and it was like really expensive. And I was like, I make my own. And so I tried making, or, or how do you use it? I mean, yeah, it was kinda... a little bit awkward. Um, I remember talking to father Pryor at the, the, the monastery. I was like, you know, what, what can I do for the Easter season? Or like, what, how can I do this more with, with my kids? And, and he was like, well, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, it's not, the, the liturgy is not as packed as it is for Lent. So Lent has a special mass for every single day of Lent, whereas Easter is not quite that way, but you have all these saints feasts, you have the Sunday gospels. And so 
the calendar's really evolved um, and we've come to add more things to it as we've watched and observed our own children and the questions. And so it's become more and more uh, clear. And so we've really come up with a structure. So it's not just illustrating it, but how we illustrate it tells the story. And we like to use the word narrative. It, right. It's a right. narrative because it's not only the individual feast days, but their relationship to each other. And um, the liturgical year is us reliving annually the whole life of Christ. And, and the, the journey saints, of the church. The liturgy of the church, yes. Um, and the saints are all living that with us. So their feast days, where they fall on the year, are all part of that narrative. So anyway, we, we can go into more specifics of the calendar. But, but I, so you, you add, I guess... You know, everyone has a, uh, a liturgical calendar they put on their wall, right? You get those calendars that are put out by, uh, you know, the fraternity or the different, you know, the different presses out there. And each calendar has a beautiful image on the top, and it's got the little white boxes down below where you write your notes. And it has it tells you the saint of the day and the feast of the day. We all are used to that. We all have that, but we realized we felt like we needed something more, especially for kids. And you consider like that the faith was transmitted for a very long time, you know, amongst those who could not read using art and stained glass windows. And I mean, just look at the magnificent altarpieces on the churches of medieval Europe, the church itself. And and you could appreciate this, you know, coming from the east, you go into the eastern churches and all on the walls and the ceiling are covered with the imagery. The whole story is told. And I feel like we need something like that for our home. And this calendar project has become... It's almost like we didn't start with this question, but this it's become this thing. And the idea is, what can we put in our home that can be a focus point that sort of shows everything? And it keeps help a little thing that can help keep you aware and grounded all year long. So not just Lent, not just Advent, but all year long. And that calls to mind visually just a token of what the church is having us meditate on. Because the whole idea is that we want families and kids to use this as a tool to help them remember and then to go dig more. You know, there's so much more in the liturgy that we could ever pack on just a, a simple little illustrated counter you put on your wall. But the idea is to be a constant reminder. I mean, of, of and so, and, and through that for families to enter into the liturgy and I, that's, we're hoping to be a piece of that rebuilding of Christian culture by you could say slowly turning our homes into like little monasteries, the domestic church, right? So we need beautiful things to put up. And that's this whole project just sort of sprung up from all the things she described. And then th this thing has taken a life of its own and we it's in this present form, but I'm hoping as we go forward, we need a few more things, you know, I, I, the, in the middle ages was so replete with so much beautiful art. We've got to come, we need artists, artists creating that kind of thing again, adorning our churches first and foremost, but then also our homes. Well, so one thing, Timothy, is I did, uh, I, I saved some images to show the audience of where I'm pulling some of these um, concepts from reference images. We don't have to go into it right, right. now. Right. No, 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 no. Um, just because th what the work that I'm doing is very humble in comparison to what I'm inspired by. But it's fitting because it's for the home. But the church has in her church, you know, has just a, a, a rich heritage of beautiful art. So, yes, absolutely. I wanted to share one comment from Wesley. He says, very grateful for their products, instrumental to our family being introduced to traditional Catholicism and the TLM. My kids love waking up every morning to see what Saint Day it is. <laughs> oh, Good. That's, that, that I can say, yeah, this is what. Uh, myself my own family my own kids and and also kennedy hall uh he was the one who introduced me originally to this i i think what's what's so great about your calendars is that um as you as you mentioned christendom it, when when and where it exists in a in a whole social community it immerses the children in a whole social fabric of a, a, a liturgical rhythm which permeates the whole community and the, the the city, the village, there's festivals, processions, all sorts of things like that. And if we're living in a, in a world that doesn't have that, your calendar Sorry. nevertheless opens that uh, that 
like greatness of, of Christendom into the domestic church to begin that restoration right there. Well, you know, you've written that book uh, you're, you're just coming out, The City of God versus The City of Man. You know, and it, it occurred to me that we're all destined for heaven. But while we're here in this world, we need to, I think we need to try to shape it as much as we can to resemble heaven. And I think in the Middle Ages, that's that's just what they did. And so I guess as we're seeing a renewal of tradition, even if all you have control over is your house, shape it as best you can and live it. And and it'll catch on like a fire, we're hoping. I mean, and that's in a sense, the, the monks, that's what the monks do. That their whole house is ordered that way. And so living next to them, we we want to you say it and, and it, it this is for the children, but I'm struck by we are all children still in a way. And uh, there's that, well, I think we all know the scripture, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Part of, part of with the calendars that I've noticed, even like priests and seminarians that come in, like that they know their stuff even better than I do. <laughs> and they'll look at the calendar and they'll be in a state of wonder because they're looking at how everything's connected because visually for the first time for many of them, they're seeing the relationship because in images you can see multiple things at once. Whereas when you're going through the liturgy, it's one day at a time. And so that state of just wonder and noticing things is, I think, um, uh, a gift from God. <laughs> I'm glad to get to help with it. Yes, definitely a gift from God. Uh, and this work is is a gift that you're giving to the faithful, to the church. So, Michaela, you wanted to talk about some of your inspirations? Yeah, so um, maybe we'll do, maybe we can toggle back and forth between yeah. the source images and then the advent sure. calendar. So we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and bring show, up the, show some um, of the imagery. Um, so here's the advent calendar here. Uh, you, get, you all can see it, I hope. Oh, wait, go see, for, we, well, we can go to your source images first. Well, yeah, and Christmas. if you zoom in on your computer, that'll zoom in on right, the right. broadcast as well. But do you want to talk about the calendar Ad, first? Let's, let's go to advent, the advent calendar. Okay. We'll go back. There we go. Okay. There we go. Oh, did it go? Stay in. <laughs> Sorry. I hope it doesn't make y'all dizzy. <laughs> so this is the advent calendar. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about how um, how these calendars are created. What you're seeing is one piece, but really all this is created um, individually. So each image is is painted or it is designed, painted um, at a much larger size. And then it's like a puzzle where we we scan it in and then shrink it. And, and my sister, um, my sister Kateri does all the Photoshop stitching, um, to bring it together. If we were to paint this all together, it would like fill a wall. It'd be way too big. <laughs> so that's why we do it in pieces. Uh, it also gives us flexibility. So each year we can shift the pieces around where they need to go. Cause, um, Saints feast days don't always fall on the exact same day of the week. Um, You'll also notice that there's the individual days, but then there's the frame. And the frame is designed um, based upon the season and the different things the church is meditating on that season. Um, so for these penitential seasons, being this one's Advent, and then for Lent, we chose to do a wood, um, a wood frame. Um, this one's kind of fun because... I knew I wanted to do wood, but I decided to do the wood inlay, and that was kind of a new feature. Right. I try to put different um, architectural elements in each frame. Um, so actually, I did have a source image for both. Um, I pulled some uh, some wood inlay, a wood inlay picture, and then also um, the style of the wood is kind of taken loosely off of, uh, what's this called? Um, Timber frame. <laughs> Timber frame. <laughs> Thank you. So go ahead. So like see this arch here. So I would I go and I look up different pictures and then kind of like, okay, how are certain joinery done? It's not perfect. Don't look too closely at the calendars, but it's it's inspired by <laughs> right. Timber frame. And then the and next then one, this is, is an example of what's called wood inlay. So it's just different kinds of wood that are cut and then laid in to make a picture. So that's how the Let's design see see. of the mantles. That's how these are, you know, graphically designed. Could you explain to them briefly just the week, how the, the, the layout of the week? Right. Well, the, the, you know, the way the, these calendars take their cues from sacred time, not so much the way 
it's you know organized uh, secular time so that you know Sunday has a place of primacy that's why it's larger um, the way the the frames tell you uh, the rank of feasts you'll notice these different frame types and you'll notice these numbers down here it tells you the corresponding ranks you can see you know visually and each week is begins with Sunday goes through Saturday and each of our calendars covers four weeks of time so we have this unique sort of you know, because of the formats that we're in, uh, each calendar is able to cover a maximum of four weeks of time, each spread, basically. And so many seasons that are actually longer than that, like Easter being seven weeks, will take up two spreads. But we, we it gives us a kind of creativity because like here you see at the end of the week, this is Christmas Eve, so Christmas Day falls on a Saturday. So we're able to take the, you know, but we don't illustrate Christmas Day until the next spread. So how how that falls, whether or not, you know, because Christmas, one of these years will actually be on a Monday, right? And so you'll have you'll have the fourth Sunday of Advent, but then we'll have all of this space to sort of draw. So every year will change in that respect, but it gives us these creative pockets to do illustrations uh, that, you know, continue to illustrate different particular aspects of that season. And our hope, so part of why we've really thought carefully through how we laid this out is so a child can come up to this calendar and recognize, oh, it's an arch with words at the bottom, that's a second class feast. Or, oh, the words at the bottom, it's flat on the top, that's third class. Or if it's got the the smaller image with the scroll on the top and the bottom, that's a fourth class or a feria. And um, I mean, it's it's reinforced by the, the Roman numeral at the bottom of which class feast, but even a child that can't read or recognize that can slowly learn um, that. Yes, my, my children always, uh would identify the red what i would call the red martyrs because they've got the red and uh they my three-year-old would point and point out all the red martyrs because there's the red uh ribbon yeah well that's our goal is that kids will and they always have a poem always, always well they're supposed to some some of the saints i haven't <laughs> I'm still trying to make sure that all the saints have a palm or we've also developed a little bit of a of a um added thing where if it's a commemoration of a saint um those are handled a little differently where there's, you know, the little, um, the little side cut out like here, so this here is, is on, um, this on the 10th of December. Right. So yeah, this little cut out shows that it's a commemoration. So. Right. So if there's not, um, another image, sometimes I'll actually put the, the saint in the, in the mainframe and then put the symbol of the saint in their commemoration cut out. Yeah, sure um, is. Are we going to give him a, a skip, skip to one of them? <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to just, just for viewers, I wanted to show real quick what this looks like in uh, when you actually get it. It's a, it's a high quality printout uh, that ends up being like this. So what we like to do is we like to put it down on a low coffee table and then all my children look at it so they all can look at it really up close because there's so much detail that you've, packed into every little nook and cranny of this and so then they can they just look at it and there's all these little things like i remember the for good shepherd sunday during eastern tide you had this wonderful little image of of jesus the good shepherd with a staff uh facing the wolf and and, yes. and my my two sons loved that image it was so much fun um but my wife we we had talked about buying some kind of um uh, like hard plastic frame or something to stick them in every every uh, season. But just just so viewers understand how this gets printed out when you buy it, this is how it ends up. We we don't even have our copy yet. I'm really excited. It should be coming uh, <laughs> soon. <laughs> you you or your wife sent us a picture of uh, the copy as y'all got it, and I wanted to send a picture back of Michaela and I like looking at the camera. Yeah, saying, like trying to look at yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> trying to see because we haven't gotten ours yet. <laughs> oh That's man. All right. Yeah, it, it just so everybody knows, uh, we got questions in the chat. You can buy it at the link below in the show notes. It's from Sophia Press, uh, the very first link in the show notes below on YouTube. You can buy at it's uh, right now. It's a twenty five dollar subscription, and it's going to be what you'll receive is just the Advent Christmas cycle, and then you'll get more of them. We'll we'll talk about details in time, but uh, quarterly subscription twenty five dollars a quarter. Uh, four basically, you know, uh, four times a year. So and you'll be four or five sheets per section. Like for example, volume two, which we're feverishly working on now, will actually be five sheets because Septuagesima and then two sheets for Lent, two sheets for Easter. 
Here's a so, question real quick from Alex. What's happening with the old Liturgy of the Home memberships? We're about to fire. So I've been rebuilding our members area and we're, I'm, I've got a whole new rollout and hopefully I'm aiming for about November the 21st. Um, I need to have the first installments of the companion guide because there's a companion guide that goes with these calendars. It's only online right now. It's digital only. Eventually we'd like to publish it, but it'll go through each and every day. And it will go through a complete like because you probably noticed when you got your posters in the mail, there was a little companion guide, a small one that just explained the overall details. I want to go into detail. So with that will be available to everybody who purchases the companion guide. But the liturgy, of the home memberships where we have the coloring pages for each day, the monthly dedications, I'll be opening those up uh, about a week before Advent. So everybody who's already in, it'll all, you'll have a new members area that looks better than last time. And we're hoping to add. Uh, a lot of new members because the the calendar is meant to be one piece of several that we're trying to make a suite of different things that families can use in their homes to live out live the liturgy. And we have some aspirations to even really grow the membership into something bigger. But we're taking it, you know, right now the calendar project it's it's consuming all of our time. But like I'm, you know, I would like to get some a music section in in the membership where you can where we actually record. And have the sh sheet music that we make for like hymns, old hymns that need to be rediscovered. You know, for example, we all know. Oh, I still have to fix that. That I see that. Yeah, <laughs> there's that that website issue. I'm the web guy, so I know I've got some. Well, I, I just wanted to show viewers. I, I I'll put this link <laughs> as well. So liturgyofthehome.com. This is the Harrison family company, basically, that's producing yes. then this calendar, which is very much the bedrock of the everything. But as as Jeremiah is explaining. There's a whole companion guide for all the different things. Uh, no, for example, there's coloring pages for the kids for all of these different uh, saints, all sorts of great stuff. So it looks like, uh, Jeremiah, it looks like people can go to membership info and click put me on the waiting list. Is that where, yep. where people should go right now? Yep. If you're not, um, if you're interested, um, when I give the final announcement, just give us your email there and you'll be finding out word you know, by, by around the 21st or so of November. We want to give time for folks to print, you know, items to be able to use. The idea is once you're in, there's materials that you could come and use every, every day, you know, every, if you want every day or every week to go, you know, help celebrate the liturgy in your family. Yeah. So, Wesley says the coloring pages are great. Kids love doing that every day. Yes. Wonderful. They do. Wonderful fun for homeschool. <laughs> Well, also right. for me, like a lot of moms, there's a lot of great coloring pages out there. Some are a lot better than mine even. Um, but I don't know <laughs> if you're a mom and you have kids that really want to do it right. They're going to ask you every single color. What color should this be, mom? What color should that be, mom? And you're like, okay, just color whatever color. But part of the beauty is, is that every coloring page also has a corresponding picture that it goes with that is already colored so you can just say look at the calendar dear and you can see the colors <laughs> and it makes that part much easier sweet yeah well i just sidetracked us because i just wanted to show the viewers what what this oh, actually you. looks like thank uh but you. definitely go to liturgythehome.com you can sign up for the waiting list <clears throat> to get on the the um refounded website as well <laughs> Um, and I'm hoping if, we, you know, as I was explaining a little bit, I'm hoping we can add some new stuff. So our goal, if we could get where we really want to go, is to have a whole suite, you know, even to have like recipes, to have um, music. You know, for example, there's a lot of hymns that used to be sung during Advent. It's not just Christmas carols. I mean, even even we don't even know that we're trying to pull these things back. We, we have some friends and neighbors who know of a lot of old hymns and music that used to be sung uh, at Advent. You know, you, well, you've got like for Martin Mass and other seasons of the year. So we want to put together a whole, um, we want to have several things and have it all collated and organized together to where a busy mom could hop on and see everything right there at her disposal for that week. Because there's a lot of stuff out there online, but it's not all organized and collated and brought together in a way that really, you know, fits artistically and stuff. So that's, that's kind of the unique charism that we're, we're trying to go for god willing and this calendar is like like you said it's the first piece but if we can get continue if this you know enough people like this and i think we're filling a need this is where we want to grow into 
Yeah. This is uh, what a great fruit of really the monastery. I mean, this is just Christendom b- being built by the grace of God mm-hmm. because this mm-hmm. is what has always happened. The monastery goes off and and founds they go found a monastery and then the faithful gather around the monastery and they slowly build a village and a city. And what you're doing is you're you're doing that. It's flowing the grace of, and uh th- but this this is so exciting. Uh my wife bought the um I think it's Sophia press also publishes the cooking with the saints cookbook. Uh, and just mm-hmm. the little things that we do every year, the, the recipes the songs, all sorts of fun stuff. Anyways. Um, do you want me to put, put, put up your, uh, screen again? Sure. You want to keep yeah, so finish showing them the commemoration? The, sure. Yeah. The, we the were, little updated. We'll go um, back to, uh, okay. Where we were in the imagery. So this is a uh, kind of a new feature, um, because we wanted to, show more of the saints that were commemorations but without confusing the children because it's 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 still it's still a feria the mass of the day is still generally the previous sunday um so we still have a little cutout which the, that little uh, um arch so you, there yeah, the, on, the the side, on the side that tells you that that saint prisca is a commemoration um so but you see her in the main image but it's a smaller image it's got um a quote taken from the liturgy in the scroll at the top and bottom. Um, so the saint is help, helping to serve as an example of the liturgy or of, of our meditation on that liturgy. But the symbol of the saint is now in the commemorations um, spot. So you have the, the palm and the crown and the star, but that's why it's not red at the bottom. So that could confuse the children. They're like looking for the red martyr. She's holding the palm. The palm is in the right. commemoration spot, but the mass, the priest will, will be wearing green because it's a feria. And to and basically to explain this, like it, most in our previous, the way we we're doing it, we always had a commemoration. You always had a picture of the saint in the actual image. But we noticed that there are some commemorations where it's a feria day. Like this right here you see on your screen, this is a saint's feast day. This is St. Hilary and with a commemoration of St. Felix. And so you have a picture of St. Felix and the spider. But there are some many days which are just a feria. So and we ordinarily would find imagery from the liturgy, from Dom Guéranger, from, and we realized, wait a minute, we have a commemoration here, so we can actually put the saint there. And that, that's what why Michaela thought, well, if we're going to do that, what are we going to put in that little cove that we always have for our commemorations? And so we put the symbols there. So here so. you have St. Prisca there on the, the left and then on the right. This is the fam- it's a family, Martha. Um, it's Marius, Martha, Artifax, and Abigail. Thank you. So... Um, that's why there's four crowns and four four palms because they were all martyrs. Um, and this is showing them they were uh, early Christians that buried the martyrs. And so this is showing them in that um, that act of, of, of burial. You got to see the shovel in the background. There's a palm laying across the person to show that that's a martyr. Um, and then from the liturgy, I believe it's from the... Um, it's either the gradual or something where it says instant in prayer, pursuing hospitality... No, I'm sorry. This is from the epistle. Um, this is them being an example of of that. So that's why we've kind of been growing the and I, I like I thought the language because this this is showing hospitality to the dead, right? You know, and that one of the corporal works of mercy, right? Yeah. So that Excellent. was just I think that was just our explaining sort of the basic structure. In the actual calendar oh, yeah. you're seeing right now, this is our Epiphany calendar. Right. And I guess I'll, I'll take a moment just to show one of my favorite pieces, which you guys know. But because earlier we talked about how this medium allows us to uh, depict things all together. So here in the season of Epiphany, you know, the church has always held that Epiphany is a, there's three Epiphanies. There's a threefold Epiphany, a threefold. And and even tradition holds, as far as you know, that they all actually happen on January the 6th of different years. You have our, our the wise men coming to our Lord, and you have the baptism of the Jordan and the wedding feast of Cana. Well, in the season of Epiphany, those feasts always line up in this kind of configuration. So we took the opportunity. You see the star over the Magi sends out two rays, which land upon two other days. The following Thursday is the baptism of our Lord, and then another ray on the second Sunday, which is the, the where they read the gospel, the wedding feast of Cana. So there's just this project, like we we discovered that, like we were drawing and we were reading about that, and we realized, wait a minute, these feasts, like I did not know prior to uh, working on this with my wife, that these feasts always occur right there in that season of Epiphany, and so 
there's just been so many opportunities with this this medium to depict those things in the borders of the image. You want to know something else kind of fun? This is an example of like, I'm still learning as I'm working on it. So I came to find out after I'd drawn it that the rays of light coming from the star, um, if you go down to the, well, here, see how, so on this scene right here, the ray of light is right. It's, it's, it's both going through Jesus's hand and Mary's hand is right there on that ray of light. And then when you go down to the wedding feast at Cana and the ray comes down, look, there's Jesus's hand in blessing. And then there's our lady's hand. And I just thought, wow, like without even necessarily intending that it shows the special um, uh, relationship between our lady and mediatrix of grace and then Christ, you know, I don't know. It just, you never tell anybody. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So even like I'm still noticing connections as I'm doing compositions that I didn't even necessarily think about intentionally, but I realize they're there. And so that gives me courage that even despite having, you know, four, four little kids and homeschooling and living out, it's like, okay, I think God really wants me to do this because sometimes I'm like, how are we doing this I, project well, even? <laughs> I mean, to, to speak of that, I mean, I, I, the way I felt for a while is I feel like we're, working at a little company, the upper management of which is up in heaven, just the things that have sort of the doors open. I mean, the yeah. fact that we're talking here with you and that you guys found it and that you have a poster now, it was Sophia. You know, the fact that we're able to get published with Sophia has just been a huge boon. Uh, they reached out to me. We were, wa I was wanting to talk to them, but they actually reached out to me first. So many things have just fallen in place. Uh, which we've honestly, we've kind of needed them. And I, I would say like a lot of keep going. the majority of mothers that I know that I have talked to that want to live the liturgy in their, the, live the liturgical year in their home more. Most of them are overwhelmed. <laughs> most of them feel like they're not doing a very good job. I am right there with everybody else. And so this whole project's really come because this makes it all, this helps. It makes it a lot easier and it's helped my family. So I'm not coming as one that's got it all figured out, but I am learning and, sh and sharing what I have. Yeah. And that, that's the great thing about Christendom is that there's sort of this cultural momentum, which happens, as you said, Jeremiah, there's the upper management in heaven, which is the, the graces that are making this thing happen. And then there's also just the momentum that happens between families as we share with one another and help each other. And this is a the great way of doing that. Um, how about um, tell us more about how do you come up with all of the imagery? You mentioned Garanger. Tell us more about how this comes together. Shall well, we show them some of the source images? Yeah. Or? Well, let's let let let's go back to the Advent source images because that is where the images come from. But as far as the content and the layout, you know, it's I'm not creating it. I'm discovering it and then drawing it. So I do try to read through as much of the commentary of Dom Guranger as I can. Um, Cause I feel like he's kind of, he's the central figure for putting it all together. Um, and uh, there's a whole story behind his relationship to our monastery here and, and us, but, um, and then I also have some other sources that I pull from because for me, oh, for us, for families, we're trying to not only enter into the liturgy of the church more, but also the cultural elements. So like the monastery, they follow a very, their own monastic traditions, but there's a lot of cultural traditions that came from, uh, especially from Europe during the medieval times. So I do try to pull from like Maria von Trapp. Um, I have a book by Father Weiser about the different traditions. So I do read other sources and then try to pull those in. So um, when I look and I follow the fraternity calendar as far as the main um, structure of what, why, what saints are, you know, in, on what days, different calendars are slightly different. Um, and then I do try to pull in historical feast days as well, but they are put in like the frame. They're never like. Um, so you can see one here, here on the 10th of December, historically. It's Feast of Our Lady of Loretto. Right. So it's not on the old calendar. It's on the new calendar. It's a, it's a historical feast day. So, but because it's special, I wanted to put it there. <laughs> um, so the frame is really where I have a lot of flexibility. Um, and then newer saints, I also sometimes will put in the, in the frame as well. So like here's Juan Diego. He's on the new calendar. So he's in the frame. 
Um, but see, you have him here. There, He's kneeling, facing Our Lady there. And so anytime that there's, uh, and any newer saints that are 1800s or, um, or later, they're drawn um, in oval frames uh, as they would be represented either by photograph or as miniatures that were painted um, from that style. So kids can also recognize, um, so for an example. <laughs> they can also recognize the newer ones, um, but they're depicted without, um, that's why there's no halo no title because it's meant to be as a photograph. Um, and so I don't want to get into it too much. There is debate about some of the newer canonizations and the changes, the canonization process that I'm very aware of. Well, then we've had um, to think too, you know, this is, this is an old, this is a traditional calendar where it takes, so how, you know, how far, what do we do for integrating old and new? We've really had to wrestle with that. And so we've, we've, we've decided to place our anchor in the traditional calendar. Uh, but then, you know, but I, I do reckon so as many people have even said it'd be safer to just leave off the new saints. But um, I've really thought a lot about it. And at this point, I feel like those persons should be there because the calendar is is a living thing. It's not a museum piece. But I also want to be careful that um, my goal is to get this in front of as many children and families as possible. And so in order to. Um, avoid making a statement or saying one way or the other, these newer saints are depicted um, in this way, which um, lets the kids know that they're newer saints, but also it allows the parents to present to their children um, uh, how they see Don't fit. So if, if in their home, if they accept the newer canonizations, they can say this is, you know, um, Saint so-and-so. And if, and if they're kind of uncertain about it, they can just say this was a really holy person or the, you know, Saint, you know, this Gianna Mola was a mother who gave her life for her child. Like it, I, we want the parents to be the ones that choose how to teach their children. And in this time of confusion in the church, we just don't want to be a stumbling block. So we're not saying one way or the other, but we're just trying to get this to as many people as possible. And I hope that, um, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really love, I think you've done a great job really integrating this. Uh, it's what I've always, I've always loved about the tan calendar, which, which combines them all together. Right. But yes. your calendar really uh, obviously brings it all to life. Um, do you want to speak at all about um, anything about the customs? Yes. Um, let me... Let me just start with, um, I said this uh, on, on another channel as well. Um, for me, my heart is for mothers, especially mothers dealing with uh, burnout. <laughs> if you're trying to homeschool and you've got a bunch of kids, it's very common to deal with burnout and feeling overwhelmed. So um, I would say to those mothers, if, if they're able to get the calendar and put it up, they've done something because the kids will go up to it on their own generally. Different kids are different, obviously, but and they'll ask the mother the questions and it takes the initiative a little bit off the mother. If she's feeling like, okay, I want to do a little bit more. Um, you know, where is some first, where's the good place to start doing, um, living the faith a little more in our home. Um, I want to encourage, uh, celebrating the feasts of your children's namesakes. I feel like that's really a good way to begin. If you're going to choose like, well, what feast day, um, that's a really important place to start. So, um, and obviously different saints feasts have different customs. So you could look up, you know, if, depending upon what your children's names are or what their confirmation saints are, you can choose. Um, after that, um, I feel like the next thing is, um, well, they're not necessarily in this order, but one of the other very important things is baptismal anniversaries because that's also very personal. So I think, you know, bringing the, the um, our faith and making it personal to the children will really help them as they're growing up to, to own it. Um, so the day that they were baptized, um, decide. And, and you have a, a form where we, that based upon. We've, we've kind of come up with a way of commemorating that. We, this all began because our oldest son was born on Christmas and we thought, how are we going to handle the presents? How are we going to make sure he doesn't feel left out? And then it just kind of. Um, it's taken a life of its own. It's taken a life of its, its own. Yeah. Now my whole family does it this way, at least for all the grant for for our children, for our our, um, our niece and nephew that live nearby. Um, so we went and got 
or I, I researched <laughs> and I want to make this available on our website. It's not up there yet, but um, we have a ceremony that we do. We try to invite the godparents. We actually um, do gift opening on our children's baptismal anniversaries rather than on their birthdays. Um, unless it's a gift given by a relative who's not Catholic, <laughs> then we let on my side, we let, <laughs> we let them open gifts from those people on their birthdays, but from all their Catholic, you know, relatives and, Friends, they usually get them on their baptismal anniversary. Um, so I created a file, which I want to make it digitally available. It's front and back. This is just the renewal of the baptismal promises. And we do this every year. The children, um, uh, we set up a, so, yeah, sorry, I should say, in our home, we have a special place. It's a feast day table. And so anytime we have anything special, we set up the feast day table to reflect what's going on. So for the baptismal anniversary, we have their, um, I let them choose what statue they want on there. They have their, um, we have the Paschal candle. So each year I try at Easter to make a Paschal candle. This one's been through two years already. So it's just, it's, it's a candle and then um, you buy uh, just wax and cut it. This one, I had some paper uh, cut out that I put on. Anyway, this is a Paschal candle, the, the, the numbers have burned down. So we have that on the table. <laughs> And then the children's um, baptismal candle. And during the ceremony, their candle is lit from the Paschal candle, which is a reflection of what happens in the baptismal ceremony. Um, I would like also on our website sometime, telling my husband, <laughs> not every time, um, I want to make available a just simple, so that this, this is a normal candle. We, we get these from the monastery, but the you can buy them anywhere. And dipped, just, beeswax. Beeswax candle and then we buy you can also buy just wax there's just little sheets of wax off like amazon and then you cut them in different shapes and it's really simple because you just cut them out and you just use the warmth of your hand to press it in to the candle and so you can cut out different shapes um that's our daughter's baptismal candle this one is my son so it has a different cross a different shell um, but if we could just make available templates, oh yeah, I'll show that on our website, people could just buy on like Amazon or wherever you can, or craft store, you buy wax, cut it out. And then I paint it on top of the wax, but you don't have to do that. And then this is a, a German custom of putting the sacraments that the child has received. Um, so this is confirmation, first communion, first confession, and obviously the, the shell symbolizes baptism. Um, but the idea is as the child grows, they add the other sacraments that they receive. And then um, at their uh, at their wake, um, their candle is burned all the way down and out. So the, this candle stays with them for their so now life. I've, I've, now, I came across this tradition after my children had already been baptized and I had the little candle, you know, they give you for that comes along with it. And so I thought, well, I want that part too. So I just took the old candle and I dripped the wax from the old candle on top of the new candle. So it still has their old original baptismal candle with it. So that had to take a little creativity, but um, you don't have to do all that. I just wanted to show um, what we've developed over the years, but we've been doing this since for the last 10 years, I think. And our kids, they have all their baptismal promise responses memorized like my even the little ones can do it. And we sing a song and um, it's just, it's just a cultural thing that, that that's kind of grown. We didn't grow up with it, but our kids are growing up with it and it's, it's um, hopefully growing deeper. When I, when I've come to realize, I think it really matters a lot. You see, because the kids every year they're being asked those questions and every year now that they're old enough, they're responding with their own voice. Right. And I feel that that, something's taking root in them by this recognition and they see all their siblings doing the same thing too. I wish we had a picture so, I could show you of, of one of our ceremonies, but uh, maybe we'll just post it on time, our website. Yeah. If you check our website, we'll try to have a section for baptismal anniversaries. Not quite yet, but it'll get there. Not yet. You have a um, table that you decorate for mm -hmm. the baptismal day. You've got the candles and everything. And then you have on that baptismal certificate renewal, you then have a little liturgy that you do. So, Yes, it's basically These patterned. It's yeah. patterned after what what is said during the baptismal ceremony, but it's it's a renewal. And so, you know, Jeremiah or whoever is the leader will say like, 
you know, Abigail, do you renounce Satan? And then Abigail will respond, I do renounce him and all his works. I do renounce them. And um, after she's done her whole profession of, of, of faith, then the baptism, she, she lights her own baptismal candle from the Paschal candle. And then, um, you know, Jeremiah will say, the light of Christ has been entrusted to you. So you guard the grace of your baptism without blame. And it goes on. And then we, we have a, we have a space on there for a litany of the saints for our family. So on the template, it's blank. You could put in the saints of your, of your family. Um, and then we all pray together, our father, Hail Mary and glory be. And then we all sing a song um, called may the Lord bless and keep you that we all sing to the child on their baptismal anniversary. And then there's a consecration of the child to the blessed Virgin that um, the parents say, um, I might also put in one that the child could say as they get older to reconsecrate themselves to Our Lady. Um, I don't have that currently on this one. And then we usually have dessert and the kids open their presents. And it's it's a really lovely day. The kids love it. So Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Well, we've got about 15 more minutes. Um, we could talk more about the calendar or any other customs in November. Yep. November. This yes. is... This is very simple as well. I love simple but beautiful things. Um, so what we do is we have a printout. Um, I I got this from, I think, Shower of Roses originally. I don't know where she got it from. It's a blank template, and you uh, can put in on each day a different soul of a deceased family member or friend. So that way, instead of just praying for all the souls for the whole month, you kind of have specific people that you pray for on each day of the month in November. And then for my kids, I printed out just a collage of different people that they know that have passed away. And so that way, when we say, oh, today we're praying for Grandpa Lenore, well, here's the picture, you know, of Grandpa Lenore. So the kids, you know, oh, they can kind of put a face to a, a soul. And I feel like um, I kind of put them all in like this kind of sepia tone, um, just to kind of help reinforce that they're they're on the other side of the veil um, rather than doing color images because kids see color images, they think of people that are still, you know, present in this life. So it kind of helps um, in that. So that's basically what we do. We, we, we're, we have a graveyard nearby. Um, we try to go visit the graveyard and um, pray for the people there. And visiting graveyards is a very... Um, important custom for children and teaching them proper etiquette in a graveyard is very important. <laughs> they don't always naturally know you don't walk over graves like no, there's you know, there's the body of the person is here and um, death can be kind of a scary thing for children. But I feel like as we introduce these customs, the church has had it, it gives us a comfort like this is how, um, how yeah. we think about it. this is how we there are friends and we're here, we can help them. You know, right, and they can help us. Well, and, and then you know, you just recently had uh, your your podcast a few days ago where you went over the Day of the Dead, the, the four of you guys, and you talked about that 15th century piece with the dance of the dead, the way the skeletons were coming, yeah. and they would come to a bishop, and they they you know that we've got to bring those back. We need those back. You know, the, our culture is so filled with these ghoulish depictions of goblins and death and all this stuff that's all scary and it, it's meant to incite fear we've got to bring back take up space for what the a, a truer representation of death and how we ought to feel towards it how we ought to be uh, towards it. I'll, I'll say i want to do it so we've been talking about things to do in the home but there's a whole other topic which is community what can right. you do as a community we just had two really important uh, events. One was the pilgrimage. There's the Three Hearts pilgrimage to the monastery. It's a three day pilgrimage that over um, 900 people came from all over the country and worked walked 34 miles through the countryside here in Oklahoma, which can be kind of rough. Yeah. Well, so my husband and, and my two sons did did um, did it. My youngest son did the entire thing without using the buses at all for the 34 miles. I mean, me, me and Patrick, we had to fall out at some point. We, uh, we pushed was... ourselves as far as we go. <laughs> but anyway, but you could just see the impact that it had on the children to be seeing all these other people walking and suffering, you know, offering up this as penance for what's going on in the world. And, um, my son, uh, Nico, you know, he was determined he was going to walk the whole way and he got sick afterwards because he pushed himself so hard. He's uh, almost eight. Um, but he was really impressed by seeing these other people walking and he was going to do it too. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I was – part of me is like, I, no mom wants to see your kid get sick. But to also be like, well, but the good for the soul of that in- inspiration um, – really made a big difference. And my other son, Patrick, he was talking to me about, you know, some of the boys he saw that ended up being on crutches for a few days afterwards because they were so sore from from uh, walking this pilgrimage. Um, so, anyway, so I wanted to mention that. But then also we just had our All Saints Day party and um, one of our neighbors is incredibly um, knowledgeable and she introduced, um, we, we were all around the bonfire um, and we were praying for the souls on the, because is even the saint, the, the feast of all saints is the vigil of all souls. And so in, in the night, um, while we were praying for the, for the, for the holy souls together, she had, um, some of the older children dressed up in white carrying candles and they were walking kind of on the perimeter of the yard off in the distance. And that kind of represents the souls, um, just to kind of have that visual. The souls are coming and visiting us as we were Right. She said that during those three days of, the vigil of all saints, all saints, and then all souls. It's kind of a triduum. And traditionally, culturally, it was a time when the veil between the different, um, the different, uh, what do you call There's church militant, church suffering, and church, church, suffering, suffering, church, and church suffering. triumphant. And during those three days, the veil between those different groups are is very thin and they can kind of be closer to us in a way during that time. And so it was just interesting to have the bonfire and to see these candle lit figures kind of off in the, the distance um, while we were praying for the Holy souls. And then the kids were all singing a soul cake song because an old customer said it before trick or treating and all that, it was the people would go cake. around and they soul would offer to pray cake. for the souls of deceased uh, family members in exchange for, for treats. <laughs> and so there's a song, my kids all were singing it and with the group and it's a soul cake, a soul, soul cake, cake, a prayer, prayer for a soul cake. Yeah. And so then after they say sang the song, then everyone got donuts. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, yeah. So anyway, just these are some cultural things that, you know, you may not be able to be near people that are doing this, but maybe over time we will do that more and more and our kids will see this is a community thing as well. It's not just we're doing it in our home, but we'll work fantastic. There. Yeah. Well, the I mean, the monastery is very much a, a, a definitely a, a great beating heart of Christendom in, in North America to a great degree. There's other centers obviously, but um, the three hearts pilgrimage, does that happen every, uh, every fall? Every, every year, every, uh, in October, October. October. Okay. October. It's, it's patterned after the pilgrimage of Chart. So it's very, it's a lot of similarities in how it's structured. 34 miles. Uh, you camp out two nights. Uh, then, then when, when they come in to the to the church, the Abbey Church, it's to a lot of fanfare. It's really a sight to behold. You know, the mass is packed. They have the church packed wall to wall, and they're you know there's organized in the chapters, and the chapters have their banners and flags. And so, you know, at this time we were privileged. Uh, when Pat and I fell out, I actually went went back home just for a little bit because we live right next to the monastery. Well, the route of the pilgrimage came right in front of our house. So we stepped outside and just watched the whole train. And Nico, of course, was was in the yeah, train. Yeah, he came past he us. His face was there. smiling and beaming. We, even <laughs> somebody on the pilgrimage said, hey, we love your calendars. And like, <laughs> <laughs> like, hi. So, I, I don't think, I'm not sure if we even mentioned the name of the monastery, but it, we are talking about Our Lady of Clear Creek Abbey. Clear That's Creek the Abbey. Benedictine Monastery in Oklahoma. Yeah. If you can come, uh, make a uh, retreat. Make a retreat there. It's yeah. a great. It's a great place. We need more of them. There's, you know, also, there's also there's another beautiful house, Gower, the, the nuns, the Benedictine nuns of Gower, and but uh, Clear Creek. I guess we're partial that we're oblates there, but you know, we're, we need we we need monasteries like this all over the U.S. Yeah, and already you know Clear Creek, they're busting at the seams. They yeah, already they have preparing you know a foundation in the next several years in New Mexico. So, but this is, this is how it goes, right? Yes. This is how we're going to rebuild, you know, the kingdom of Christ. Um, honors. How much time do we have? Are we, are we out? I mean, we're, we're, it's, it's flexible. We, we've got, uh, we've got time. I, I, we've got one Canadian said uh, <laughs> that uh, Darren yeah. 31 says if the borders open up, we are coming from Canada next October. Oh, we oh, look forward boy, to seeing you. God willing, so that will happen. Sorry, boy. What's is it? It's just. It's astounding what's happening now. I mean, it's just amazing. It's like the Iron Curtain falling here. It's just, it's hard. I don't know. It's, well, it's wild. When you, when you see 900 people walking, you know, down down your street carrying banners, you know, for Christ's kingdom, it's like, okay, 
this is the future. <laughs> right. <laughs> we yeah. just gotta, you know, keep doing that. Yeah. Well, so, anything else y'all want to uh, go over? Um, I just wanted to briefly give a little bit of the history of our connection with Dom Guranger. I, I don't I won't go into too long, but um so we live by Clear Creek Abbey, as you mentioned. The mother house of Clear Creek is Faucombeau in France, and the mother house of Faucombeau is Salem. And Salem was founded by Dom Guranger. So it's like the grandmother. And um, so we have a very like familial connection with Dom Guranger and the liturgical year that he wrote was obviously hugely instrumental and more and more people are coming to discover it and learn about it. It's a bit daunting. So we got it as a wedding gift. It's, it's like a, how many volume set? It's 15 like, volumes. It's like set, on our shelf. It's like all these books. <laughs> so um, part of why the calendars, um, they're kind of helping to bring that what's contained in those books, bring some of it to where it's more accessible to children. Right. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention also is, is that, um, the reason why we have Clear Creek is because of, of a special program called uh, the Pearson Program, which was uh, put together by John Sr., uh, Professors Nellick and Quinn um, back during the si crazy 60s at, at KU, um, the university. And uh, some people are, will be familiar with, with Senior because he wrote the book, uh, The Death of Christian Culture and then The Restoration of Christian Culture. Um, so there were so many conversions coming from the secular humanities program <laughs> that these three professors put together that they ended up eventually shutting it down because they said they must be brainwashing these, these, these kids. Um, but in fact, so many of them ended up converting and then the... Um, uh, Many of them went over to Fokombo and to other monasteries of the Slim Congregation uh, because they they said, where can we go live this beautiful life that that we've been discovering through the, the humanities program? And Dr. Senior directed them. He said, well, in some of these monasteries in France, they're still living this Christian culture. And so they went searching and they found it. And then what happened is there were so many Americans over there in these monasteries that they eventually sent them back with a few French monks to start Clear Creek. And, and that so, was, that was always Dr. Senior's desire. He wanted to yeah. get a monastery. He wanted to see a monastery founded, I believe next to the, next to the college there in Kansas. But I think the, 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 the Pearson program, it was really founded on wonder and mm -hmm. wisdom begins in wonder. And so um, I think the heritage that, that we've kind of have, being attached to this monastery is both coming from the Pearson program with Dr. Senior and then also from Dom Guranger and the congregation of Salem. Um, and so the calendars are in a way sort of a, um, a, uh, what do you call it? They kind of come from that. It's a fruit. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that. That is fantastic. I had no idea that there was that connection between John Senior. I, I mean, I'd heard of that great story, which was a, a very much a light in the darkness at that time uh of these these men these professors catholic professors is talking about literature and awakening mm -hmm. something in people that brought them to the faith uh, but i think that your your calendar really manifests for the children and for all of us i, I mean as i said i mean i love it too it's it's this great childlike wonder that you awaken uh in the way that uh this beauty connects us with god who is beauty Yes, that's my hope. I'm glad to be an instrument to help with that. <laughs> yeah, that's all we're trying to be. Yep. Really, is just uh, there's there's good to rebuild Christendom is going to take lots and lots of laborers, uh, and this is just one. I like to think of these calendars as kind of like it's a token, a uh, little a little icon of icons. I mean, it's not a real icon, but the way it's all synthesized together, and I'm hoping that this work of ours just inspires both an increase in devotion well, for ourselves and for Catholics everywhere, but also for other artists to, to step up and to make other beautiful things that can adorn our homes and sort of just, what is it? I love what GK Chesterton says. Uh, I'm going to bust the quote, but I just, I love it so much. He says, you know, Christianity, it's, it's a religion that knows it because it's a religion that knows how to come back from the dead because it's God knows the way out of the tomb. And right now we're witnessing that, you know, you sort of when in so many places, it seems like it's 
it's, you know, the old, you look at the church hierarchy today, you look at the mess in our world and yet something's happening and it is people are noticing it's all these young families with tons of kids and it's just, there's a life there and you you wonder where's it coming from? Well, from tradition, from the treasures of the church and those of us who are trying to rediscover them and then trying to lift them up again uh, and figure out how to live them. You know, we're, we're, we're a bunch of hobbits where we don't know what we're doing. And, uh, but it's happening. And then, you know, it's happening. And then you, you have other figures, you know, like Dr. Kwasniewski and other fig- fo- folks who are very well educated who are speaking, you know, it, it, something's coming together. It's like a groundswell. And we're just, we're glad to be a part. We're glad to be able to contribute this piece. We're glad to, we're glad that Sophia loves it and has is, is magnified, you know, this project. And honestly, we're just, we're just going to keep going day by day and see where God leads us. And, and we're so glad to get to talk to folks like you. And, you know, it's just, it's really neat. Yeah, I, I, I'm so glad that we could connect and uh, we could connect our families and everything. It's really uh, beautiful. I mean, our, our, and as you said, uh, talking about the way that this is growing, our Lord compared the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, who, yeah. which is the smallest of all seeds, and yet it grows into a great tree. And that's this is this is like what what I experience when my son has this moment of clarity or joy or wonder you know, in these calendars, which is just connecting with the in- infinite God. There's something that's uh, completely makes us forget about, you know, all these worries about this or that, because there's sort of something greater there. And so, uh, so once again, please uh, subscribe to the, the calendars. You can get these for your family, for your kids, begin to build the liturgy of the home, which is just the beginning for Michaela and Jeremiah and all of us together as we, all of us together, uh, build Christendom in our families, in our hearts, in our souls. And so thank you so much for all of your great work. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, we're so pleased that uh, you're giving this gift to the church. Well, thank we you for too. your encouragement. Well, she, she's she got to draw. She loves, she just you know, she could not draw. I'm glad <laughs> we were able to found an, an, this, an outlet like this that, well, if you're wondering what part he plays, I come to him like, how, what, I, what should I do here? I'm stuck on this. So he helps me collaborate a lot. And then between me and then my two sisters helping, we're able to, by God's grace, oh, that's pull right. this yeah. off. This I would is, not be able to do it alone. <laughs> this is a family operation. I, I just mentioned that. There's four of us doing this this work. The, the, her two sisters, she's two younger sisters. One of them does nearly all the painting and the other does all the digital assembly and stitching because you know like we mentioned earlier the way these are drawn they're drawn in pieces and they're stitched together finally at the end which means we don't really know fully what they look like until we get to the very end but also enables us to repurpose the imagery multiple other ways and so the the three of them we i mean i like to joke we're running like a little art sweatshop in the back room of our Our, house our our master bedroom is our office (laughs) (laughs) and then i i'm I'm doing dishes and running the website and doing all sorts of things the kids (laughs) trying to now we need prayers if you say prayers for us uh, oh yeah well yeah yeah speaking of prayer well let's offer up uh, our father as we do i wanted to bring up this is the uh monthly dedication this is another thing we didn't even talk about this but this is another feature that y'all had with the literature of the home and i'm sure you'll continue to do this Mm -hmm. but this is the monthly dedication that you can do as a family and so this is for the month of april for the blessed sacrament and i think this is very fitting because i think this this art right here really showcases so much the the wonder that you are trying to awaken and by the grace of god you do and ultimately it's the eucharistic face of jesus that is the our greatest wonder, perhaps on earth. Yep. And and I think that this this uh, painting that you've done really captures that. And so, why don't we offer up? We'll close out. We'll play in our Father, and for all of the intentions that that we're trying to accomplish by God's grace and and building the domestic church, and ultimately leading the souls, our own souls, the souls of our spouses and our children, to the Eucharistic face of Jesus. So I'll just pray the first half of the Our Father. Y'all want to pray the second half, Very and good. we'll close out. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily, daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King.